This is a podcast about cells, all about cells in fact, and by the end of this podcast we should be able to identify the differences between plant and animal cells and know about the organelles, which are the individual parts of the cell, what they are and what they do. So just looking at the screen here, what type of cell is this? And hopefully you have decided that it's an animal cell. The quickest way of deciding that it's an animal cell is the shape of it. It is not a particularly regular shape. You can see it's all in and out, all over the place. And that's because it just contains an oily cell membrane. And we'll come on to this, but plant cells have a rigid cell wall which gives them a more fixed shape. So that is an animal cell. And the first thing that I'd like you to notice about that is that it's absolutely beautiful. It is a thing of beauty. It is this wonderful three-dimensional globule. Isn't it? I think the problem about uh, textbooks is that we get this two-dimensional shape of cells, and we, we tend to look at them as just this drawing. But look at that. Your body contains about a hundred trillion of those little suckers. And it's always important to remember that they are three-dimensional. And as we look at that cell, we can actually, even though it's not a diagram, hopefully identify some of the things that we need to know. So looking at that cell, what can you see that you think you might know from the textbook drawings that you studied? Well, we'll go through them. And we'll just give this okay. ability to draw an arrow here. The first and most striking thing is this beautiful and the nucleus is the part of the cell, the organelle, that runs part of the cell, organelle, that controls the cell's activities. It does this because it contains DNA. And DNA is the recipe which is responsible for building everything in your body, in fact. And it's like a blueprint. You know the way you see architectural plans are kind of blueprint. Uh, or, or just like a cake recipe like that, it tells your cells what they need to do and what they need to build. And in fact, you can see the DNA, it's the red little strands there uh, which are inside the nucleus. So it's always worth remembering uh, that the nucleus contains the DNA, but for our purposes, we would say it's responsible for controlling the activities of the cell. And in that respect, it's a bit like a brain. Um, this is where you must be careful with analogies. Please don't say it's the brain in the cell. But it controls the activities of the cell a bit like your brain control your actions. So, in terms of uh, what we will be uh, looking at next, the next thing that we... Every single cell has it, and we should make sure we label it, whether it be plant or animal. Um, on the very edge, which is the cell membrane. Okay. And the cell membrane is outside of the cell in animal cells, which is responsible for controlling what goes in and out of the cell. And this is crucially important because I'd like to take you back to the early environment of the and let's just look at that. You see, look how inhospitable. It would have been a terrible place to live. You've got volcanoes, you've got clouds of acid, hydrogen, sulfide gas. There wasn't any oxygen, in fact. There you can see the moon, which uh, would have formed uh, about, sure, about 4 billion years ago. And life first started, I think, about 3 billion years ago. And at first, it was just molecules of life. And the difficulty is, is imagine, looking at that picture, you were on a dry, acidic, hot part of the environment. Then, you know what? You just died. There it is. And if you were in a more moist part, or a bit cooler, then you might survive. The world was a terribly difficult place to survive. And in fact, for many of us, it still is, of course. But what happened, which was a huge consequence, is that, going back to our cell, 
impact cell membrane. These molecules of life learned to be able to control their internal environment. And that meant they could control what went in and out of their cells, so they could create their own rules inside. So even if Imagine if it's really hot and really acidic out here. That meant that inside the cell, by controlling what goes in and out, it's possible that this cell could resist the harsh environment outside and therefore carry on business as usual inside. And it, it's a bit like uh, an igloo. Um, imagine if you have an igloo in the Antarctic. Uh, you are going to die if you're just out in the Antarctic, but if you have an igloo, you can control the temperature in there, and it allows you to survive when otherwise you would be outside. So the membrane is a huge, huge step in evolution, and that in fact is what creates a cell. A cell is its own micro environment in which you can control what goes in and out. And that was a hugely important thing. For my sister, and I've just got that. So, now, looking at that cell, let's look at the other things that we can identify. Now, on this, uh, just rub the arrows You know what that is? Is a big clue, and if ever you're uh, thinking about an organelle that looks a bit like that, it looks a bit like an elongated walnut, walnut cut in two. It's the mitochondria. Plural is mitochondria, and this is the powerhouse of the cell. This is the powerhouse of the cell. This is where energy is released by the process of respiration. Notice I said that energy isn't produced or made, it's released. And it is in the mitochondria and the process of respiration that the cell gets all the energy it needs for all of its processes. Remember, nothing happens in the universe without energy. And in our bodies and every single one of our cells, the energy comes from the process of respiration and aerobic respiration, which is with oxygen, is where, which I say, the mitochondria is where that takes place. Just a bit of cross-referencing, we should be able to clearly say what the equation for respiration is, which is glucose plus oxygen equals to CO2 plus water, and that is a huge, huge important part of that. It's amazing, actually, how often that equation will come up. So whenever you're doing your biology, always think, does respiration or photosynthesis occur here? So, mitochondria, hugely important. So, that's another thing that we need to know inside our cell. And we should be able to look at a picture of a cell and identify these things and know what they do. So, what else do we need to know in an animal cell? Well, the next thing, Ribosomes. Now, these little dots here are the ribosomes. And they are responsible for protein synthesis. We've just got to know that. Ribosomes is protein's home. And you there. And it's just a case of making sure that you know what these things do. They're on the nails and they have rods. Ribosomes produce proteins, cell membrane in and out, the mitochondria is, is responsible for aerobic respiration, the nucleus contains DNA and controls the activities of the cell. So we're pretty much almost done on the animal cell. There's just one other thing we need to do, and that is to mention the general blue area 
all in one. And that is the cytoplasm. Now the cytoplasm is where all the chemical reactions in the cell happen. It's true that there's also chemical reactions happening in your other organelles like mitochondria. But the cytoplasm is this kind of gloopy gel which gives a really lovely arena for enzymes and substrates, cross-referencing to proteins and enzymes there, to come together, to collide and to react. Imagine if you had two pieces of paper that you wanted to hit each other. If you put them at one end of a box and just without any liquid at all, just in dry conditions, put them at the end of a level box, they would never meet. Take the two pieces of paper though, fill the box up with water and swirl it around and the two pieces of paper will float and move around and eventually they'll hit each other. And that's a collision. And now, imagine you've got millions and millions and millions of different pieces of paper that you want to collide and that is closer to what's happening in the cell. You've got loads of enzymes, you've got loads of substrates, loads of chemicals and they're all mixed around like a big soup. And the right temperature, which is about 37 degrees in our body temperature, and the right uh, amount of water and liquid enables this gloop to create an environment where reactions can happen. So that is the contents of an animal cell. So we need to know that and we need to know now what the differences are between an animal cell and a plant cell. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rub out all of these because I would like us to take it as red that you know that and if you can identify the nucleus, mitochondria, cell membrane, cytoplasm, and ribosome from that diagram, then you're going to find it really easy when you look at something like say, this, which we're going to do later, which is the more orthodox version of the cell. But I, in fact, would like to concentrate on that animal cell. Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it into plant cell. And in doing this, I'm going to highlight the differences between the plant and the animal cell. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a green box around the cell. Now, automatically, we can see a change in shape. That is now, instead of this globule in and out, not really particular regular shape, it's a much more regular shape. And that is because of one of the big differences between a plant and animal cell, and that is the cell wall. Plant cells have cell walls. And a cell wall is a hugely important part of a plant cell. It is made of a substance called cellulose. And cellulose is a bit like rope. And the best way of describing cellulose is, from your own common experience, to think about something like celery. You know how fibrous celery is? You can tear off those strips, and they're like little bits of string. Well, there's loads of cellulose in celery, and that's to remember. Um, but in every plant, there's loads of cellulose. And this gives a really tough outside to the cell. And this is hugely important for a plant cell. Because you have a wonderful skeleton made of hard bone which is able to support you against the pull of gravity. But plants don't have that. They've got to grow up in the air against gravity. And it's kind of magic, isn't it? Because they've got no skeleton. And the way they do this is using the very tough cell wall. They do this by having such a strong outside that if you were to fill it with water, the water will push out against this cell wall, which is so strong that it will resist a bit like blowing up a balloon really right to the edge of, of, of before it pops. It's actually really quite strong, isn't it? You push it and it's very rigid. And in fact, you can imagine, if you could balance them, that if you did that with, say, five balloons, you could balance something 
on top of those five buildings. Um, and it would be, say, I don't know, four foot off the ground. Because you blow these blooms up, and so they're nice and plump, and then you're raising that thing that you're balancing, say a book, if you can stick the blooms together, off the ground. The end result is the book has defied gravity. And that's what plant cells do using the cellular cell wall. They create these really plump cells which are filled with water and that enables them to push against this cell wall which is so strong that it won't give and that enables the plant to almost have a skeleton which is able to be gravity. And you know that water is so important because if a plant doesn't have water it goes all floppy and you say that's water because there isn't the nice plump cells pushing against each other to raise the plant up. So that's a hugely important role of the cell wall, uh, cell wall should I say. Now, I just mentioned by mistake, now I just mentioned the roots the cell membrane, but I would like to point out that there is still a cell membrane Plant cell, and I'm going to make it this kind of blue colour to match the outside of that cell membrane with the animal cell. Because what actually happens is the cell membrane spreads out in the plant cell. And that's exactly the same type of cell membrane that exists in this lovely, beautiful three dimensional cell we have here. And it has the same role it controls what goes in and out of a cell. Now, for me to draw this cell membrane and then say, that's responsible for what goes in and out of the cell. It's got to suggest that the cell wall isn't responsible for what goes in and out of the cell. And that's a really important message. Don't be confused into thinking that the cell wall, because it's on the outside, controls what goes in and out of the cell. Lots of stuff can get through the green hair to get through to the blue. But the, a bit like the bouncers on the nightclub door the membrane which controls what goes in and not so membrane. So then we've got our cell membrane. And we need to look at what else is different in a plant cell. Well, the answer to this is first of all something which is quite obvious to you if you think about it. And I'm always wanting you guys to think about what you know about biology. And so if I was to ask you what the difference between a plant cell and an animal cell was, I think I could ask you what, what the plants do that we don't do. And uh, you could say, well, I'm going to sit there and do nothing all day, right? But hopefully, you'd also be thinking of photosynthesis. So if plants do photosynthesis and we don't, they must have something in their cells which enables them to do photosynthesis. And hopefully, you are thinking about the chloroplast. So I'm going to draw one in here. And now notice that I'm going to a green colour. And there's not just one, there's loads of them. And so these chloroplasts are responsible for photosynthesis. They're green. They contain a pigment called chlorophyll. And in any colour diagram, they are going to be very, very obvious because they're green. Okay. And plants have them. Humans and animals do not. They do photosynthesis. It really is a simple fact. Now, what else does a plant cell have that an animal cell doesn't have? Well, I'm going to kind of wreck this song, I think, by adding something that's going to take up quite a lot of sound. And use this to black. It's a big sack. And this big sack. Sand, and it's responsible for storing things for the plants. 
cell, and also uh, it does help the plant cell in pushing out that water, which makes the cell nice and plump. By the way, the word we uh, write for a plump cell, which is often called is turgid. Strange word. Turgid is something that's really plump. Flaccid is if it's really floppy. Okay. And the vacuole helps in that as well. And so we have got, let's just get rid of these extra words, we have got three things here that we need to add for a cell, a plant cell, to make an animal cell. Remembering that an animal, a plant cell has everything else an animal cell has. So, we've got an animal cell, and then to it we add the cell wall on the outside, we add the vacuole, which is a massive huge sac, which can take up a lot of the cell, much bigger than the nucleus, which is often pushed inside, and then we've got the green chloroplasts, which is what's for photosynthesis. Okay, so that is the way that uh, an animal and a plant cell might work. So now, let's just go down, and I said that we would go back on the orthodox view, and you can see that it says the textbook diagram of an animal and a plant cell. Now, these are the ones that you need to know perfectly. You don't have to draw that beautiful three dimensional fluorescent gorgeousness of that cell, although I hope it does show how elegant they are. This is what we need to know. So, this is just really going over what I've shown you before but in a textbook way. So, if we were to take the animal cell first, we can see here it's got the nucleus, so it's the plant cell, see here, it's just, you, know, it's ours. you can see here it's got the nucleus. cell membrane here, and they are in both. It's got the mitochondrion here in both, and it's got the cytoplasm here in both, and it's got the represent here in both. Okay. So you can see here that we have got the same in both cells. Once again, look at the kind of rich iterous uh, um, kind of square shape. Look at this. Bang, 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 bang. It's a much more rich shape than this kind of circular animal cell. So, the last thing is just to concentrate on one of the more, which is to show you the differences. So, if I was to uh, cross these out, see that the only things that are not crossed out now are the permanent vacuole, which is actually similar size to the one I made up there, but they can be bigger in a plant cell. The cellulose cell wall, which is the last uh, big one plant cell on the outermost outside, and the chloroplasts. So, that is the difference between the plant and the animal cell. And if you have listened, you should be able to draw a list here of the organelles that they have in common and the organelles that they only have. So a really good task now for you would be to do these two questions. Which organelles in the plant that are in common and which does only a plant cell have? And if you can answer that question and what those organelles do, you are in such good shape. So best of luck guys. Uh, any questions, please email me. But if you know all that stuff, it's a really, really good building block for so much to come about science.